Chapter 5. What the State Fears What the State Fears above all, of course, is any fundamental threat to its own power or its own existence. The death of a state can come about in two major ways. A. Through conquest by another state, or B. Through revolutionary overthrow by its own subjects. In short, by war or revolution. War and revolution, as the two basic threats, invariably arouse in the state rulers their maximum efforts and maximum propaganda among the people. As stated above, any way must always be used to mobilize the people to come to the state's defense in the belief that they are defending themselves. The fallacy of this idea becomes evident when conscription is wielded against those who refuse to defend themselves and are, therefore, forced into joining the state's military band. Needless to add, no defense is permitted them against the act of their own state. In war, state power is pushed to its ultimate, and, under the slogans of defense and emergency, it can impose a tyranny upon the public such as might be openly resisted in time of peace. War thus provides many benefits to a state, and indeed every modern war has brought to the warring peoples a permanent legacy of increased state burdens upon society. War, moreover, provides to a state tempting opportunities for conquest of land over which it may exercise its monopoly of force. Randolph Bourne was certainly correct when he wrote, quote, War is the health of the state, but to any particular state, a war may spell either health or grave injury. We may test the hypothesis that the state is largely interested in protecting itself rather than its subjects by asking, which category of crime does the state pursue and punish more intensely, those against private citizens or those against itself? The gravest crimes in the state's lexicon are almost invariably not invasions of private person or property, but dangers to its own contentment. For example, treason, desertion of a soldier to the enemy, failure to register for the draft, subversion and subversive conspiracy, assassination of rulers, and such economic crimes against the state as counterfeiting its money or evasion of its income tax. Or compare the degree of zeal devoted to pursuing the man who assaults a policeman with the attention that the state pays to the assault of an ordinary citizen. Yet, curiously, the state's openly assigned priority to its own defense against the public strikes few people as inconsistent with its presumed raison d'etre.